what we're going to do tonight is have a look back uh, quite a ways to 1970 to 1980. Um, have many of you been to England before? And I'll just put this into perspective. Okay, I, I know you have, Bruce, and, and Frank, because Frank in about five minutes is going to get the shock of his life, I'll tell you. Um, if you imagine England as a sort of a triangle, and with London down in, in the bottom corner, then over here, uh, about three quarters of the way across, is Oxford. And uh, ten miles south of Oxford is a little town called Abingdon on Thames. It does really sit on the Thames, and I stress the word Thames, and I tell everybody in Connecticut about the Thames, and it is not the Thames. Please, <laughs> it's the Thames. So, this little town of Abingdon was relatively sleepy. It was mainly agricultural until around about 1927-28, when the pressure on space in Oxford uh, became, as it is in many places today, rather too much to bear. Uh, some people got greedy and started charging high rent for very small uh, places. And uh, a chap called William Morris, uh, who later became Sir William Morris, told another fella uh, called Cecil Kimber to go down the road to Abingdon and open a motor plant, um, which was called the MG plant, Morris Garages. Um, mainly the workers were recruited from the surrounding farms. And this is one of the reasons, not very often realized, as to why the spirit that uh, pervaded through the Abingdon factory from when it first opened uh, in 28, right the way through to the last day in October 1980, uh, was still that same family spirit. They'd never known anything else. To work at MG, you had to know somebody who was already working at MG, a father, an uncle, a cousin, or something like that. And literally, the 1,250 workers at the MG plant, as it finished up, were handpicked from the surrounding countryside. It was a great privilege to the people around there to work at MG. The factory itself was an anachronism in terms of modern automotive uh, development and plant, as you will see. Now, I know Bruce had been there, and Frank's been there. In fact, uh, Frank went there with me. And during the period from about 69 to 80, right up to the week before it closed, I used to go along to the factory periodically and got to know them very well. We had friends down there, and we were allowed to go inside and go down the production line. What you're going to see tonight, if you've got an MGB, or an MGC, or an MGA, or even further back, is exactly the same methods that they used to build those cars. It wasn't until 78, 79, that MG realized that they could generate further enthusiasm by inviting the various MG clubs along for a conducted tour of the factory. And they started these, uh, these tours, and they went right the way through almost until the end. And in fact, the American MGB Association were the last people to tour uh, as, a, as a proper entity, the factory, in 1980, when uh, they came over in September. Uh, so we'll start off. And what used to happen was that, you can dim them now, Paddy. This is the, uh, the sign that was outside the factory if I can find the other end of this thing here. Sorry about this, Scott. You're going to have large yards of tape. This was a sign that was outside the factory all the time it was in production. Uh, the home of MG Sports Cars. And this actually is fixed on the wall of what was, the windows behind it, the telephone exchange of the factory. And I'm sure you all know, even if it wasn't in the trivia last night, that the telephone number of the Abingdon factory was 251, Abingdon 251, and you might also know that the chassis number of every car that was ever built, or every type of car, all began 251. So the first MGB was not MGB 001, it was MGB 0251. And that 251 is perpetuated to this day because the post office box number of the MG Car Club in England is post office box 251. And uh, so the number keeps going. 251 had a significance for Kimber, and uh, it was kept going in many different ways. What used to happen, the clubs, and here is one of them in 1978, uh, including a very youthful John Hill, who's since become a, a multimillionaire in MG Spares, 
um, and this was a meeting of the MGB MGC club and they used to meet about five miles away from the factory at a pub called The Greats at Yarmton. And uh, having had lunch and a couple of pints of beer, the factory tours usually started round about two o'clock. And here they are with their MGBs ready to drive off to the factory uh, in this particular instance, and uh, where they were to meet at five minutes to two uh, at the factory. So here we are getting into the cars on, on our way to the factory. However, not all the groups met at the... I feel awful sitting down there, You're like a school teacher. Uh, not all the groups met at the greats at Yarmton. Um, some of them met at this place, which is the Magic Midget. Now this is a pub, or an inn, in Abingdon, which was conceived by the people at MG, uh, developed by the brewery in Abingdon, who is called Morland's Brewery, and uh, the whole thing was a tribute to MG and the Magic Midget, and the pub is called the Magic Midget. Outside there are murals on the walls, as you can see, and uh, those, those two cars are my uh, MGB Roadster and my V8, um, and uh, inside the pub it's totally MG uh, memorabilia. Now a few years ago this died away because the new landlord couldn't see what all the fuss was about. But the minute his taking started dropping something like $1,000 a week, he started to put it back up on the wall. And all this stuff on the walls of this, these shots that you see, do you remember this, Frank? Yeah. Very well, I'm sure you do. Gustav Ruberg from Sweden, Chris Roberts from Atlantic City in New Jersey. A very youthful Chris Roberts. He's worried a lot <laughs> since then. But this was eight years ago. Uh, and on the walls are all the memorabilia and photographs, and the driver's patches, the photographs of the old factory, magic midget, and car club badges from around the world. So if ever you go to Abingdon, a lot of people ask me what can they still see? There is still a lot to see in Abingdon to this day. So don't be afraid to go. MGB grill on the wall, and uh, a history of the MG cars from 1930. And most people finished up at this gate, which is the famous gate three. Can you see me? I'm sorry. Which is the famous uh, gate three at Abingdon. And uh, we took one or two shots on this particular day, and Frank was with me on this occasion, and these shots were taken. They always flew the flag, the MG flag on the factory, and this is the outline of the buildings today that you can see here, uh, which standard life have kept the outline of the buildings, but is now used as a grain store. There towards the end is the telephone exchange and the gate into the paint store. And I'll describe how they got the cars onto a second level in one minute. But this is as the factory was back in the 70s and uh, the early 80s, or the outside of it. There's a poser. You just see the MG flag going out there. And uh, maybe you can see a useful Frank Ochil, Rich Stinchcombe, Gustav and uh, Chris Roberts. And so when you got through the gates and you parked your MGs there, you were then taken in crocodile file to a reception area where you were met usually by a man called Peter Franklin, who was personnel director, uh, who then detailed two guides, ex-employees of the factory, who were going to conduct you uh, on a tour of the factory and explain to you what was going on. Once inside, you were told that photographs were strictly forbidden and you must not get your camera out under any circumstances while you were going down the line. But they always managed to ask you when you'd finished, did you get any good ones? <laughs> and uh, here you see a, a party about to go around the factory. Everything in the factory, right the way through from 1929 through to the end was MG. This is the canteen clock. And there were about 14 of these clocks dotted around the factory and uh, Kimber always had these clocks, the NG clocks, and uh, the works notice board here uh, was for the, for the workers, and on here there was the disco, they had a very thriving uh, sporting section, uh, an NG buffet dance here, you see, and then here's another one on Saturday evening, and funnily enough, and I didn't know this until I got this slide back, but they were dancing to the Ken Smith Trio, now, I know nothing about that, so there must have been another Ken Smith in Abingdon at that time. 
Okay, so the bodies arrived from Prestil Fisher down at Swindon, as you heard in the trivia quiz last night. Six at a time, these are GTs, uh, on a, a, a transporter. And what happens here is that these are going onto the upper deck of this building, which was known as A Block. And these come up first, and then this is raised, and the, the other six go in. This is a two-story building, and I want you to remember these two stories all the time we go through this uh, visit to the factory. Once the bodies came off on that second story, they were put onto little trolleys that were pushed along by hand. And this is where your MGB was hand-built. Because here are the bodies which have arrived from Prestil Fisher. In some cases, they've arrived with the, and uh, forgive me if I slip the terminology, they've arrived with the tops on, and the first thing to do is to get the top down and remove the hood. And these hoods, which they then remove, finish up with the car when it gets downstairs as a finished MGB. They learned late in life that uh, bird droppings and MGBs don't travel well together. And on this upper story of the trim deck, as this is known, and I to refer to the trim deck, uh, the bird droppings, they, they were always getting paint spots when they got downstairs, so they thought. And they had quality control on paint and one thing another. But eventually they realized it was all the little sparrows that nest in the top of here that were making a mess on the cars. So eventually they covered them with plastic uh, until they got onto the assembly line. Now I shall refer to this kind of car and the second one. These are the last of the limited editions. Not the unlimited edition that you had over here, a black one, but the limited edition. <coughs> and as you know, the last thousand cars, there was supposed to be 500 roadsters finished in bronze and 500 GTs finished in pewter. In the event, they got more roadster body shells sent then they got GTs. So you got 504 Roadsters and 496 GTs. None of them went out of England. Here's the little trolley, and this is a body already onto the, ready to begin its journey down the line. You see this? And it runs in this single rail. And you have five lines. They always had five lines running at MGB. Sometimes when pressure was on in the mid-76, and normally there were five lines of Bs and a line of midget up to 79, and then five lines of Bs towards the end of 79, and towards the end they had three lines of Bs and two lines of a machine called the Allegro Vandenpla, which was trimmed out on the MGB lines. Here's a shot taken round about 75 or 76, again showing the little trolley that moves along on its wheels. And all your cars started life in the factory this way. Here, you will see two cards. And these are what are known as the build cards. And they told workers further down the line whether this was a right-hand drive or a left-hand drive car, whether it was a federal car or a California car or a European car. If the build card was on the right-hand side of the windscreen looking out, and this was a left-hand drive car, because eventually when the wheel finished up there, the guy who was driving it had got to see where he was going. But these stayed with the car all the time. Here we've got a selection of roads and GTs having their bonnets, uh, sorry, hoods removed. Uh, and all the hoods were numbered to the car, and the hood finished up back with the car, as I say, when it finally got downstairs, having been fully assembled. Now they started their progress down the line, we're still at the hood removal stage, but already you can see that they didn't, they just took them as they came. If a GT came in, that went on, if a Roadster came in, or a green one, and quite a few of these cars, as you know, were made to order. Uh, customers used to ring up, and dealers used to ring up and say, we want a Brooklyn's green GT, and they made it to order. And it used to take probably five days for it to get from this stage to running out of the works and being delivered and sent to the dealer with the exception of the uh, USA cars. Now many of you who've worked on MGBs wonder how the hell they get these things in the back of there and under there and one thing or another. And this is why, because they start with a bare shell. And we're already starting to drill here for the heater and the, uh, the servo, the brake booster, and for some of the uh, pollution control that is going on this car, which is a left-hand drive car, because you can see John's face through the windscreen uh, looking in. Again, towards the end, they realized that the quality control 
meant that all these people are wearing overalls and belt buckles and one thing or another, were beginning to scratch the cars. And so they got these fender covers, which followed the car all the way down and were then brought back up by a little fella whose only job it was to bring back the fender covers upstairs. They then found out in the first edition of these fender covers that they were complete and there was nowhere they could put the aerial in for the radio. So the later fender covers had a little hole where they could put the aerial in for the radio which was factory installed in quite a few cases. As you can see, running down the side of these lines is a complete MGB enthusiast mecca because there's every part that you would ever want uh, here. Starting to trim the interior here, uh, George Allen, who worked at the factory for 34 years. Uh, and bear in mind, all these people were literally thrown out of work overnight. I'll come to that later. Uh, George is here, and he's setting in the studs that go in the floor pan to press down the snaps on the carpet. You remember those? Those lovely little things that get lost and, and this sort of thing. And that was George's job to put the snaps in and also to start putting the wiring in across the top of the dash and some of the soundproofing because the dashboard has not gone in yet. Now we're starting to get things assembled here. Here we've got the heater in and we've got the dreaded anti-run-on valve here. Again, we know it's a left-hand drive car, three wiper blades and the build card on this side of the screen. There's the brake servo booster gone in and various bits of wire part of the front wiring loom. And as it moved down the line, these were added to in a way that it was quite logical at the time, but when you come to work on the car eight years later, as I said, you wonder how the hell did they get this down here? Now these shots are jumping backwards and forwards because some were taken in 74, uh, 75, some in, well, throughout from 75 through 80, so they cover a five year period. Uh, they're nearly all rubber bumper cars. And this was the one line of the trim deck at Abingdon the trim deck itself, uh, during winter, was freezing cold, absolutely freezing cold. It had a big glass airy roof. The best time to work on the trim deck was in spring and autumn. In the summer, I was saying to some people the other night, it got intensely hot. The temperature really could get up into the high 90s. So they arrived at a compromise because the lads, they never had a strike at MG. Bear this in mind, never had a strike. But the shop steward went to the management, Peter Frierson, and said, it's too hot for my lads to work up there. And they said, well, what do you want us to do about it? And first of all, they gave them salt tablets. Well, that's poor recompense, right? So then they gave them free sodas and everybody was running to the loo. They were targeted on car, sorry, to the toilet. They were targeted on the number of cars going through a day. And it used to average on one, on one line. And bear in mind, I said there were seven lines. It used to average somewhere between 45 and 52 complete cars per day. Now, it doesn't take a genius to work out that at its peak at MG, they were producing somewhere in the region of 1,400 cars a week with a workforce of 1,250. And John Thorne's philosophy, I'm sure you've heard about John Thorne, he was general manager, was one car per man per week. And it worked. And that's exactly what they did. To go back to the trim deck, they then said, okay, we'll compromise. If it gets to 80 degrees, we will reduce the daily quota of cars going down this line, right, by two. If it gets to 85 degrees, we'll reduce the quota by four. And if it gets to 90 degrees, we'll reduce the quota of cars we expect you to produce per day, per line, by six. So the shop stewards then turned around and said, that's fine, but what about when there's a test match on? Now, a test match is like the World Series in baseball. And they used to have radios in the factory, and if it got to a particularly exciting part where somebody hit a, a, home, a home run, and I'm talking about cricket now, right? Then the whole line would stop. And they say, what, what happened there then? Who was that? Who bowled him? You know? So they said, okay, well, if the test match is on, we'll knock one more car off. Right? So you got the ludicrous situation in the middle of July when England is playing Australia, where the shop stewards have got one ear on the radio and one eye on the thermometer say, go on, my son. <laughs> and by the time it got to three o'clock, they'd done for the day. And they all went home to watch the test match on television. This was Abingdon, but no other motor factory ever worked like this. 
His day job is looking bewildered because this, this guy is a real character and he used to tell some marvellous stories. Um, and I can tell you one about him because he bred pigeons, racing pigeons. And I once went round to his house, Barbara and I went round. And we went round early in the morning and he was in his dressing gown. And he said, oh, I can't see you now. I've got to feed the pigeons. So we said, OK, and we went back at lunchtime. And he took us to this pigeon shed, which he got out the back of his house, just outside Abingdon at Filford Heath. And I said, you know, this is a marvellous pigeon set. He says, yeah, he says, you know this roof? He said, these are all NGA floorboards, you know. <laughs> and they were. The whole of the pigeon thing was made of NG wood from MGAs and stuff like that. Well, sorry, we're, we're taking time. These cars are pressing down the line now. And uh, as you see, they're taken at various times, roasters and GTs, all mixed together. Later on, the lights are now starting to go in. The tail lights are in. Uh, some of the drop glasses in the doors have gone in, and the glazing uh, in the back. GTs, of course, kept their tailgates. And you can see what a complicated mess it used to be. This is not a particularly good shot. Complicated mess with bits of wire. But when you're doing this 45 times a day, fitting a wiring loom into an MGB becomes child's play. Here are some of the last ones going down the line, probably about a couple of weeks before it closed, this was. And this is one of the last uh, 400 nod uh, roadsters. This is one of the future GTs. And they were sold as the limited edition Invest in a Classic. Here is the future GT. As I said, they were all right-hand drive. They never left England. And uh, they ran a, a series of advertisements in the, in the papers which showed you this compared to an SA saloon and the roadster compared to a TC. And they said, buy yourself a piece of history. Uh, this was because MG was going to close. These were the last of the line. But it was a fascinating place, and the accents, the Oxfordshire accents, and the jokes. They had women working on the line as well. Here we've got a US car going down, side lights already in, and a lot of the plumbing, which is never seen on uh, Europe, uh, English cars, uh, already gone into the car. More wiring, and again, bear in mind, these cars were being pushed along by hand. As soon as you'd finished putting your bit of wiring, or your bit of glass, or your instrument, you just got a hold of it, and it just slid along this little rail down to your mate next door. And they came to the end of this line with the headlamps in, and various other things, but of course, no motor, no transmission, no wheels. It was still on this little trolley, and it came down this line here, and arrived here. The problem was, this was the end of the second story, and it now had to go down 30 feet to the finishing line, half of which was elevated, half of which was down on the floor. And they came up with a solution that was in use from pre-war times, even with the tea times, and that was a sling. And here you see a couple of the last of the pewter uh, MGB GTs, the limited edition, uh, being ready to go down. Now here's the bill card, on the left-hand side, because these are right-hand drive cars, they've got the brake servo in opposite to you, they've got the heater, they've got all the lights, the wires and everything. It's ready to go down now for the most of the fit. And that's how they did it. They had slings, and they lifted the whole car up bodily. Here's a, a green roadster, tundra roadster, being ready to sling over the edge of this out here, down onto the floor of the factory, now going the other way, to the way they came down the trim deck, now going back the other way, here we have a, a russet brown roadster uh, being ready. And here are the guys ready to sling it out. Now the main floor of the assembly area is down here. You've got lines five north, five south. You can see the various lines. And that's what they were known. If you got a job at MG, they used to say, where do you work? And they say 5S. And that was line five south or four north. So the cars were slung on these dollies with these huge cranes and then literally dropped down 30 feet down here. Here's one, a GT coming out, slung out up here to be lowered when this one's been pushed along to be lowered onto the line, which is line B, Bay 4 North. And then you wonder why they go wrong. This is Detroit at its best, isn't it? This is good. Okay, here we see a shot in 77, 77, 78, 77, 78, and here are the, the lower line, 
these cars are still elevated above the workforce, so that to work on that car, you've got to work underneath it. And that's because here, they were going to put the engine, the transmission, and the road wheels. When it got down here, it went down another 10 feet, and was then back on solid ground on the factory floor. Here we see another shot taken in 79, uh, of a similar line, different part of the factory, different, same building, it's still A block, all this happened in one place, but with the lines across. And here are the heavy gang. They used to get guys and pay them extra just to do this. And this is building front assemblies for MGBs. Right? And to compress these springs, put the uh, dampers on, the shocks on, and the whole of the assembly was made on this. And this was very heavy work. And they used to get the biggest guys they could find and pay them extra money to work on the sub-assembly of the, uh, the front frame. Once they were completed, they were put onto uh, trolleys like that, and the, what they call the frame lad, uh, because he worked solely for these guys who were building the frames, used to have to push this little trolley with a barrel handle here, uh, along to the assembly line so that they could pull off uh, a front suspension, complete front suspension unit with everything on. By now, the brake rotors are on, uh, the calipers are on, as you can see, and the anti-roll bar, it's all ready to be offered up to the motor car. Here are the rear axles, ready assembled. And as you know, you need one of the first one and one of these uh, to put under an MGB. And these were assembled at Drews Lane Transmission Plant in Birmingham and shipped down to Abingdon. They never used to look at them when they used to arrive, and then they suddenly found out that some of these had got no oil in and there were MGBs uh, that were going out on the road, uh, so they always checked the oil at Abingdon after two or three major disasters. Okay, now you can see the elevated line, and this has come down off the trim deck, and the cars are still not down on any wheels. They're just running along these two rails on a little dolly. Here's the engine being ready to offer up into it. The back axle's been put on this one here, and on the ones, and the line is moving that way. All everything's ready here, the next engine is ready for the car that's following behind. These are the engines, uh, these are federal engines. Again, they were built up at Drews Lane in Birmingham, uh, which was a subsidiary of the Austin Longbridge factory or the British Leyland factory. And uh, they used to have at, at any time probably between three and four hundred engines. Now, out of that lot being built up there, you're bound to get the odd duff one, and that's what used to happen. Uh, here we see a shot with some midgets going down the line, I think. Yeah, this was 77, 78, uh, with a midget going down the line. Uh, this is John Pearson, who's uh, the quality foreman at this end. And you get to know that they were, as I said, I can't tell you how beautiful, what beautiful characters they were. And when they were made redundant at uh, Abingdon, they went to various jobs. Some went to work as racehorse, head stable lads. Uh, some went to work in uh, the Long, uh, sorry, not Longbridge plant, the uh, Big Morris plant uh, up the road at Cowley. Um, and then suddenly the whole MGB thing came back because they started building the Metro and the Maestro. And they offered them transfer to Birmingham to work on these new cars, but nobody really wanted to know because they've worked here all their life. Okay, now I'm sure all of you are familiar with that, and uh, it's as easy as that, you know. To get an, MG, uh, an MGB engine in transmission in is easy. If you've got the car up this high, if you've got guys like Mark in here, and if you've got the guys to the accuracy to sling it in, and it used to go in just like that. Bruce saw it and Frank saw it, and it was like magic. And, th and then the car was uh, uh, pushed along, still being pushed along by the way, not rolling, you've got to push it on these little rollers. So when they say your MGB or your midget or whatever was hand built, it really was. Here's line A. Now what happens here was the fact that the cars were getting the brake pipes and the exhaust and everything in. Here they are down the side. Various other fitments that had to be offered up from underneath. Some of the things that had to be done that way was of course the transmission. And here we've got the body coming down onto the transmission, back and front. Here we are, the two dampers and the car ready to be loaded onto the uh, front suspension. Here we are, one of the, the last ones going the other way. 
Um, this, in actual fact, turned out to be one of the last MGBs of all, which it was a white one that went to Japan. And we've all heard the story about what the last, the colour of the last MGB was. Well, it was a white one. Here's a shot taken round about 77, 78. Uh, some of the Europeans now had these twin uh, hazard uh, fog lamps on the back, twin red fog lamps on the back. And they've got the petrol tank in by now, offered up. And it's a lot easier to do it that way than it is to do it the way we do it. And the suspend the rear suspension and transmission being put into there. Later on, again, this is about a week before the factory closed, these were the last of the line going down. And uh, this is one of the uh, the uh, bronze uh, MGBs, and we got it down, you could put wheels on it then, and now we're ready to really go, it still wasn't down on the floor, it was still at shoulder height, uh, but once we got the wheels on, we just have a stack of wheels at each side, hundreds and hundreds of road style wheels, or later on the, the star type triumph wheels, the LE wheels, then it could go down, there's some midgets on the far side, and uh, these are left-hand drive cars. I'm sure you see, but all your cars came from these lines. This is a shot taken very early on, 76. Here the midget is still in full production. We've got one line of midget, three lines of MGBs, and the same this side. A line of midgets and three lines of MGBs. This is only really half the picture. And this is when MG, MG was really at its peak during the early 70s. It was really steaming this place and uh, they got to the stage where the overtime. Things to notice, the trim started to go in on this bottom line. Yeah. They started to trim the car out, some of the instruments as well. And this is where they came off the elevator section and finally went down onto their own wheels for the first time. And that was the first time your car run was when it came off this elevator section, was slung down and lowered onto its wheels. Now there used to be some fun and games here. Sometimes the wheels wouldn't turn, Sometimes the back axle wouldn't turn, and there's another car being pushed down. But they had a, a remedy for that, and I'll show you that. Frank Pearson, who was a, another character with his, his lad, they all used to have a lad work for them, and uh, he's putting the glazing rubber in, and some of the internals inside the engine bay. Was that the one with the clock I mentioned the other night? Yeah. This is yeah. 10 minutes to 12. Uh, and this was uh, in 1780, sorry, in 80. Um, and earlier on, in 77, here's a Brooklyn's green MGB going down, the same clock. <laughs> so nothing changed. I mean, the time changed from 12 o'clock to 2. Uh, here we've got a headlamp rim. Here we've got the radiator going in. It's lying across the top of the engine at the moment. He's putting the finishing touches to all the pipes. And then the guy on the next down the line, he will screw the radiator into the diaphragm and uh, that will be him. Nearly there. They wore the hair longer in those days too. Uh, uh, again, uh, a European or a British car, right hand drive. Here's the bill cards. Where it was destined, twin shoes, brake servo, single fan. And, uh, then we saw they, they got this thing. And, because the guys at Abingdon were fascinated by this because they'd never been asked to build anything like this. It'd always been plain and simple, two SUs, and we know what makes it go. This was a whole new bag of worms. And you see the last of the line, the limited editions, they had the twin SUs. Created no end of problems, smog pumps, ERGs, air pumps, all this sort of things. And many of the time it went down the line and they really didn't know what they were doing with all this stuff. And they had to fetch it the technical expert. But later on, it got to be uh, a state of the art thing. Here we have one of the inspectors, Vic Bartlett, uh, and his job was to ensure quality control from here on out until the car was fired up under its own steam for the first time. And uh, they used to be quite strict, the bonnets, the hoods, sorry, were coming back together here, just a little bit further down, and uh, the hood number is on the screen of the glass, and that would match the number that was on the hood, which was stacked in a rack at the side, and they would eventually come back together like that. And this is the absolute end of the production line. 
everything that your car should have, or my cars should have, should be on here. Not always the case, but should be on here, because this is the end of the line. Uh, and they're going to start driving it, there's a mirror up here, so that everything can be checked from above and below, and this is final quality control. And whether you know it or not, you probably do, but they used to have a, a board in the works that told you the quality control rating of all the various groups in British Leyland, Rover, Jaguar, Austin, MG, and so forth. MG were always at the top. Whenever they had visiting dignitaries from Austin or Jaguar or Rover, they used to take the board down, because it used to upset them no end. But this little factory could always finish at the top of the quality control rating. <clears throat> now, obviously, not every car that came to the end of the line would start. True today. True today. However, this is, they were brand new here. <laughs> so, the ones that would start were brought this side of this dividing line. The ones that wouldn't start were pushed over there for the guys to have a look at and see whether it was a simple matter or whether it was going to be a major rectification job. And uh, as I said, again, this is the end of the line in 76, 77. And uh, the good ones are coming down this side. The ones that weren't so good are going down the other side. Here's a shot taken later on, 78, 79, of the same thing. Uh, we've got uh, a problem with the brown one and the white one. This one is okay. And here are the cars coming up the end of the line. This is a very bright, bright area and uh, very well controlled and very clean because it was here where the car was make or break in terms of what happened. Over on the west side of the A block, uh, this was in 80, and here we've got the last of these limited editions I keep talking about, the Bronze uh, <coughs> Roadsters and the Future GTs. This is the problem side because here are all the tools ready, the big hammers to give the fuel pump a whack to start it, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, they knew all about that. And each car, you know, in, in the early days of the TC and, and prior to that, every car which came out of the MG factory was road tested. Uh, with the volume that was produced in the 60s and 70s, this proved impractical. But I can tell you this, that one in every four or five actually went out on the road for the test drive. The ones that didn't, and even the ones that did, were put onto these rollers. And this was one of the first sophisticated roller dynamometer areas uh, in the UK, if not in Europe. And MG were the first to have it. Here comes a uh, UK spec NGB, uh, the steering wheel is on the right hand side, the built car, comes onto these rollers. And rather like they have a jet air behind jet planes, this barrier automatically rolls to deflect the exhaust back into the bay. And then from within the car, with the barrier raised, they could lock any of the four wheels, they could take it up to around about four, four and a half thousand revs and see what the output was and the whole car was put through virtually a standstill road test while it was in this area. There was a shot taken in uh, 80, this one was taken in 77. And everything is read off the uh, dials and the gauges over the top of the, uh, the hood there. Now, during the course of its journey through the factory, or maybe in the paint job that they'd done down at Prestfield Fisher at Swindon, that's how they were painted, uh, little blemishes started to occur. Here's one of your unlimited editions, as you can see. Not even got the stripes on yet, but we've got a problem with paint. And what they used to do, they used to take them there and then and rectify the paint straight away. This happened throughout the life of MG. As soon as a flaw was spotted, it wasn't pushed on one side to wait somebody. Somebody did something about it there and then. And so these have got little nicks and marks and one thing or another, which uh, uh, you know, they mask off the rest of the car and then do whatever is necessary uh, with the paint. That obviously is up under the windscreen uh, because the, this is where the sprays went here. But this would, must have been a very minor job because the whole of the bottom of the windscreen is masked off. Here we've got another. That was in 77, 78. The cars then went along to a very minor sort of emission control standard. Uh, not the actual test area, this is not the actual test area, this is part of the special development area, uh, and they just used to give the uh, compression on maybe one in 10, 20 cars, 
just test the compression ratios on the four cylinders and just see whether they were somewhere near the claimed performance. Right, cars that wouldn't start were a pain because they held up their whole life. And here's one that uh, wouldn't start, it's a right-hand drive car. And so they get pushed out from a block where we saw them on the right-hand side. And uh, they get put into an area next door to a place. This is called final inspection. A very brightly lit area where the whole car was checked again, both under the hood, in the trunk, and for the paintwork, and for the engine, and everything. Very brightly lit. These are the late one in uh, October, 1980 or just round about that time the two. this is an earlier one 76 77 the final inspection was always as bright as day and any blemish or color change on the car that you could see was seen here here we are again final inspection not as many cars this time this is late on the car is coming to the end of its life in 1980 and all we can see around are one or two future GTs uh, one or two of the uh, Golden Roadsters, uh, Allegro Van and Flaar, and these, which were being prepared for people who were buying their last MG and wanted a different colour. I'll come to that in a minute. Here's an earlier shot taken uh, in the same area. What I'm trying to say is that at the end, they really did look at your car hard. No matter what you may think about it, they looked at it to give it the best quality control that they could possibly do. Here again, now we've got a mixture of things here. We've got the GT, we've got the Roadsters. And as a sop to the people at Abingdon, once they told them they were going to close, uh, which was resisted quite strongly, they brought in this little Allegro Vandenflaar uh, on, the prom on the premise that the guys had done such a good job trimming out the MGBs that they were the only people they could think of to trim out the Allegro Vandenflaar. That's bullshit. This was a sock to them to keep them going that few weeks longer until they could put the chop on. Okay, once they were ready to go outside, the cars were herded, and that's the only word I can use together, uh, ready to be moved outside. And you see the signs up there that still say quality, quality, quality. And they did get it right, they had a bad patch in 75 and 76, but they did get it right, and the quality towards the end, even though they were going to be on the street, was the highest that any British Leyland plant was achieving. This was a place, sometimes, I didn't even, when we went to the factory, I didn't even bother to go in here, because uh, this is what not took the, the oomph out of the MGV, uh, emission control, pollution control, but they had to go through it, following Mr. Nader's uh, statements, and this is an American B being pollution tested for California, don't follow the wire there. And then, of course, the cars, finally, if they were going to come across to the U.S., were waxed, both inside, the sills and underneath. And here's the final waxing. Normally, this shutter would be down, because that stuff was evil. Um, and then they were put into the final coat of wax for shipping out to uh, the United States. <coughs> okay. Now, bear in mind, or imagine, a block where we've just been is here. Then you go across this yard. This is B block. And this contains several interesting little places, uh, such as the special tuning department. And uh, here's a shot taken uh, where they used to do all the development work, the prototypes. They used to try different stripes, different wheels, different hoods. They were always striving for something different. This is the very first MGB with that rocker stripe in 77. Uh, over here, you've got the first of what was going to be the coloured bumper. Somebody here with a white one from Minnesota. It could well have been the prototype of that. They did try that. They tried doing the bumpers the same colour as the car and to take some of that heaviness, the aesthetic view, particularly on the changeover from the chrome to the rubber, there's a lot of flack. You know, this doesn't look like an MGB anymore. And they tried various methods of making the MGB look attractive. This stripe here on a 1978 uh, BGT uh, was another development and you see by now they've started to get into these wheels which later finished up on the limited editions. They tried everything, bolt-on wires, nearly came, uh, you know, to give it that wire wheel to feel which a lot of people liked back on the, the cars in 66, 67, 68 
the wires twinkling in the sunlight were always pretty. So they said, let's try bolt on wires. It didn't work on a rubber bumper car. This is the first of the LEs back in, oh, 76, before it even got the stripes on. They're looking at various wheels, and I was telling somebody today, they had one car which had different wheels at each corner. And if it rode like a pig, it was like going over cobblestones because nothing was balanced. But uh, they did keep on trying. Here's one with row styles, a russet brown one, and one with the uh, LE type wheels, but no stripes. Now, I was telling you about the cars that wouldn't start. And this is the uh, car that used to tow uh, the cars off the line when they wouldn't start. It looks like a normal MGV.